is there a particular format which which uh, which popular music thrives in best? And is is declining space one of the issues that anyone on the panel thinks is is possibly uh, where the failure dimension is seen to come into um, popular music? Mikey, what do you reckon? I think definitely the, the space issue is is something. I mean. Even writing for Triple J magazine, I know it's gone down. It used to be sort of, uh, you had 270 words, and then recently it's like, can you review this at 170 words? Which if you're a good writer, you can. But you know, sometimes you want to ex expand on it. I know there's a guy called Ben Gook who writes for Mess and Noise, who wrote this drones piece, which went for like 1,400 words. Actually, no, it went through, I think, for like 6,000 words or something, but that was more of a, uh, it wasn't just a review. But, you know, just to have something really fleshed out, you know, you can get a lot more meaning from it. This is the thing about the, the Twitter generation and being pithy and being precise, but it's also really nice to read someone who just knows so much. Of, like I read Ben's stuff, for instance, among other writers, and go, I'm a pretty shit writer <laughs> compared. So, well, obviously these days everyone's got to be able to to write to to write pith, you know, write not necessarily two word reviews, but to be able to write economically. Clem, what's your experience with with uh, the current state of, of rock criticism? If you had to name one particular thing that you think's the most problematic for 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 popular music or rock criticism at the moment, what do you think it is? Uh, look, I think um, in a lot of cases editorially, uh, there's not a lot of faith in criticism or in, in a depth of engagement with music. Um, I suppose we'll touch on later the difference between criticism and reviewing and things like that. And our reviews... Well, you can get to that we can now. Get to it now. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, is reviewing, is it just a buyer's guide? Um, and a lot of the time, <clears throat> I think... It's more a case of uh, you know the editorial staff having failed rather than criticism itself, mm. but that that is a big problem. Um, I mean, I guess we're all fortunate to work with editors uh, and in publications that um, are able to engage with critical thought, but. That would be a big one for me. You know, you do often find that people would prefer you to just speak generally about things rather than actually um, get into the kind of nuts and bolts of things critically. Yeah. Um, Chris, what's your take on this reviewing versus criticism um, uh, configuration? Or I was going to say paradigm, but I think that word perhaps needn't come up too often tonight. But uh, how do you see it in, in, in what you do? Do you, do you think of yourself as a critic or a reviewer or, or something quite different? Um, well, personally, as a critic, and I think there's a, I think there's a, um, a massive difference between the two things. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a review or a, or a set of reviews is more of a consumer guide. I think um, criticism takes in a whole lot of other sort of disciplines, um, and it's it's a more in-depth look at, at at you know the forces behind the art form. You know what I mean? Like if it's a song or a a band or a piece of music, then it's it's not necessarily telling people whether they should go and buy it or not if they like these kinds of music. It's more of a sort of a a, a discussion on what it means. Yeah, I think I think this is the, the one area I guess that gets left out when we talk about reviewing and criticism is is the very word you've just used then discussion because uh, I was saying before in our in our dress rehearsal out the back there um, now we were just talking before and I was saying to Clem that I've, I came across a band recently that I really liked um, by hearing a conversation about them this was a, a group called the Bad Plus a, a trio from Minnesota and uh, what I heard them on was a podcast from a, a program called All Songs Considered from National Public Radio and um, I guess for me you know working in I've worked at Triple J for 19 years is the conversations about music were what got me enthused in music and wanted me to make me explore it. Um, so it's interesting to hear you say that criticism should really be a conversation. Um, how, do, how do you get a conversational tone when it's just you, though? Well, I'm not sure that it has to be a conversational tone, but it should. But it should. The tone is is up to the writer, and I can only talk about um, uh, writing because I don't sort of broadcast yeah. anything. Um, uh, the crate has a conversational tone, but that's a very short, that's 300 words. Mm. Um, and that sort of touches on what your point before. I think, I think short, really short reviews or, or pieces of criticism are much harder in a way. Mm. Like if you have um, these capsule reviews now, maybe 100 words or less. I mean, if you can, if you can sort of make a, make a, make a well-argued point in 100 words or less, then you're doing well. You know, sometimes it's easy to ramble on for 800, 900, 1,000 words. Um, 
It can be hard though if you really want to say how much you love this song and you love that song and, yeah. and why. It's an art form of its own though, right? Mm. I feel like I'm the other way around though because I've always worked in short form, mm-hmm. um, whether it's single reviews or a shorter album ones, so I tend to get a bit polaxed the more words I have to use. Whether or not I can argue my point accurately in short form is uh, probably a point of conjecture for a lot of people too. Yeah. <laughs> what happens when we move online though? Because I, I guess uh, once you're online, the, the word limit... It doesn't necessarily um, migrate with you into into digital space, and a, a lot of music criticism now is happening online. Um, is it is it giving criticism a new lease of life? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's absolutely. A, like the, it's the best thing that's happened to music criticism ever. And and where do you think it's happening? And and who do you think it's for? Like, is it? Do you think it's connecting with people in a new way? Um, oh, absolutely. I mean. The list of of great um, of great sites with fantastic music criticism online is, is is so long. I mean, Mikey mentioned Mess and Noise, really long, long, complex, interesting, well reasoned, sort of contentious pieces on there all the time. Um, the best thing, the best piece of music criticism I've read for many a year has just gone up online and it's a and it's a it's a mini novella by a by a writer in sydney who's who's spent time with uh, gareth lydiard from the drones um at his at a, at a some sort of country house when he was recording a a solo album and it's i don't know how many words is it it's, oh, it's, it's a tw- twenty thousand or something yeah it's a it's, Very a, it's long. a serious mini it's no, uh, novella in in chapters online only the world according to gaze.com and the pages the interface is a sort of a click on the page which turns and it's absolutely brilliant. Mm. And It'd be I mean, lovely I, if there was I, more of it. Sorry, but increase. Wouldn't it be lovely if there was more of that going out and being with the band for a few days and then being able to write? You know. Well, yeah. I mean, that, that couldn't exist in print, mm. not in uh, mainstream print anyway. And w- do you think? Do you think something like that would have come up? Would, would, would someone who? Uh, would, would a lot of the people writing on Mess and Noise have actually ever surfaced in any other format before? Do you think? Some of them. I think a lot of people... Is it bringing a new group of people into what... Yeah, well, a lot of people too, uh, you know, there are a lot of people like Chris Weingarten and and stuff who are coming up now who started writing for, well, back in the day, there was kind of the big three. There was uh, Pitchfork and Pop Matters and then Stylus, which died, unfortunately. But, um, you know, you get a lot of people who started writing pretty much from from the point dot for online music magazines and have now migrated out into you know, the New York Times and all sorts of places. You mentioned Chris Weingarten, and we should just, we, we should just mention, for those who haven't uh, caught up with it, that he's, he's become a big reviewer on Twitter, and he's someone who, I think he's done, what, a thousand reviews in, yeah, in, his in handle the Twitter is, format. His, so, ha- his handle is a thousand times, yes. Yeah, so, um, and, and uh, he was recently profiled in Columbia Journalism Review in a piece called Staying Alive, which is, which is really worth reading. Uh, and obviously we've already touched on, you know, the, the constraints of, of um, being 100 words or whatever, so 140 characters for reviews. I know I couldn't, I couldn't do it uh, for more than a couple of albums. Um, Who's criticism for now, and you know who, who do you think is is the is the audience, and how do you feel connected to them as as critics? Who was it ever for, though? Has it really changed that much? Um, well, I've, 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 I don't know. Like, I'm wondering who. I, I guess I, I, I've often wondered who it's for. I can speak, you know, someone who's tried to write criticism in in film, and then you know, someone who just loves reading, whether it's whether it's Pitchfork or Sasha Freer Jones or Robert Forster or you guys. I mean, um, I guess I, I read it to try and get, to put music in context, um, but I also read it to try to get ideas about what, you know, other things out there that, I'm, that I don't know about that I should know about. Yeah. So um, w- my answer to who it's for is that uh, even, even if I'm in, you know, if, I want, if I'm, uh, engaged with the process of criticism as a consumer of music, I'm also looking for the next big thing in my own mind as well. So I'm I'm kind of in in in, in both in both camps, I suppose. And um, I wonder, you know, your own experience with the people who read your work um, or who listen to you, what what you think criticism is actually, what purpose it serves in their lives. It depends if you're talking about criticism or reviewing. But um, but 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 but, but no, I don't want to get bogged down in that. But but clearly, it's for people who want to consume music and who like music and who are interested in music. At one level, the 
100 word capsule review um, of the mainstream band with a star rating is for a passive consumer, mm. whereas the whereas the um, uh, thousand word analytical uh, weekend supplement piece in a in a in a in a broadsheet is for you know it's not for a passive consumer it's for someone who wants to actively engage with the ideas in there so there's different levels i think but what it comes down to is that and i've always thought of my audience as people who love music and um people who enjoy music and people who buy music and people who want to know about music mm. does, does everyone agree that it is for a passive consumer if there's a star rating no Absolutely not. Well, we've got our first disagreement for the night. I was kind of waiting for that to happen. I love the star rating. I know it's sort of one of the uh, the notes that Laurie gave us is saying how, um, you know, reviewers hate star ratings. I, I'll tell you what I hate. I hate it when I read a whole bunch of reviews and every re review is three stars, three stars, three stars, three stars. That's a bit annoying. When you read Rolling Stone. I don't read it. So. Isn't, sorry, isn't Rolling Stone three and a half stars? I, I'm three, and a half. three to three and a half. That's a bit annoying. But I do like, you know, reading something that's really, you know, in depth or, you know, makes excellent points and then can put a star running at the end of it because, you know, sometimes you, you want to know, I think something I was going to say, like, more and more as I get older, I just want to read certain reviewers. Like Bridget Christopher for Impress does great live reviews. Chris every week in the, in the crate. That's why I'm sounding sick of fanning, but I absolutely love reading because it's so personal. Same with Clem's singles column. It's really from a personal place. So I, I tend to follow certain, certain writers because they get so involved with it. And my mum always told me, write the truest thing you know. And, if it's, and you love music, and that's what it's, I guess what it comes down to. This brings up a really interesting point. Uh, Clem, how do you weigh in on this particular issue is it is it um is, is it is the star rating something that defines whether someone who's reading it's active or passive um, look i don't know i find them a little bit arbitrary i mean we use them in the big issue and we we have had many editorial meetings about whether to get rid of them or change them to something else or you know and and i think that a lot of the time particularly i find if we have a new writer who's started they'll they, they won't realize they've got to do one and then they get really polaxed by having to distill what they've just written into a star rating um, um, I think I think it's just a lot of readers expect it, whether it's passive or active. I mean, you could look at the very long reviews in uh, magazines like Mojo or Q, and they still have a star rating. I think it's a kind of it, it allows a, a varying level of engagement from the reader's perspective. Yeah, but uh, the problem I, I don't mind them, and I've done plenty. But um, my problem with them is that you see the star rating as a reader, you see the star rating. And if it's if it's in the middle, which most are, you won't read it. Mm. Exactly. So there's the whole thing of great inflation too with stars with Australian acts as well. I and mean, we see this debate in so many different popular cultural forms in Australia, certainly with film. Um, it brings me to another point, I guess, when we're looking at reviewing and I guess reviewing all criticism, when the star light, when the star's there, um, does that make it more difficult to write about Australian stuff because the imperative, certainly in film, there's there's a big argument mm. that you know, do, do the reviewers go easy on Australian films and mm. give them higher star ratings than than other than other. Well, Summer Coda just got kicked, didn't it? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, look, personally, I would I would never go easy on a on a band because they're Australian. No way. Really? In fact, I would probably subject them to more rigorous scrutiny. Mm. Uh, is that? how you'd approach it as well, Mikey? Yeah. It came, if you get chummy with someone in a, in, a, in a record company and you're a PR person, I think, I think Craig Matheson was the one that said you should never be friends with uh, people in record companies because if you get too close, then you'll have to, you know, it'll sort of mess your judgment. I actually really, not enjoying a shut and fraud kind of way, but if someone says, oh, you, see, you know, you're going to review that, that Holidays album for me, and this Holidays album, for instance, sat on my desk for many, many months because I just didn't like their old stuff at all, but then actually went and listened to it, I can have a really good listen, and it's, you know, an incredible album. I'm sort of getting off the point now, but <laughs> sometimes with Australian stuff, as a, you know, you've got to be, be quite rigorous. If, if it's shit, it's shit. If it's great, it's great. Yeah. Particularly with new bands. I yeah. remember, I don't know if anyone remembers Neil Wedd, but he used to run a, a little column, um, I can't remember, what was it called? Indie, Indie, Indie Initiative. Indie Initiative. More and and his members. stance yeah. was that you should be very kind to new, uh, to young Australian bands. It's bullshit. Just complete bullshit, because if they're sucking, they need to know. Mm. <laughs> so they can either change or, you know, maybe not change. But um, it uh, it does happen a bit. There is a, there is a sense that you should be kind to yeah, an... a Australian 
Australian bands and then, then there's many subsets below that. Should you be nicer to mm. independent Australian bands? Should you be nicer to whatever? I mean, I get, I get told I should be nicer to female artists because I'm a woman, obviously. <laughs> there, is um, a, there is a subliminal sort of pressure to, yeah. to do that. But you got in trouble over Jet, didn't you? Oh, did because, I ever? Because you kicked against the pricks when everyone was going on about how good they were. And yeah, you actually I just said, said well, it's actually, actually it's, it's a croc. Yeah, it's and, basically a covers record. all hell broke loose. Yeah, it was hilarious. It became a thing. It was, um, you know, a Clem versus Jet to the point where I, I, we, we, or we, me and the band got over it very quickly and everybody else carried on. And then um, I gave their new record uh, a star rating I gave it I think four in J Mag and, and, and it all kind of came up again Jenny, Jenny said my editor she said you know I feel like I should make this into a cover line Clem Basto gives Jet four stars How often do you listen to it? Oh it's in my iTunes okay. Um, but there was <laughs> the point is when you, you were, you were at your well everyone was expected to go mental because they were the great white hope and they were going to save rock and roll and it just was not that great and so that's what I said and I, I also said the same thing about British India and I was banned from reviewing them um, Jet could cop it a little bit more sweet I remember goodness. when I reviewed Titanic um, and gave it three <laughs> stars that someone uh, a few weeks after the film came out emailed me and said see you were wrong <laughs> Based on the fact that it had become, you know, a blockbuster. And In I your said, face, you know, my view hasn't really changed. But um, this brings me to another question about, and I think it is an occupational hazard with critics. Um, our, our views as consumers of music, you know, change all the time. Uh, do you ever feel that you need to recant on something you've said or go back and revise your view on something that you've written about? And do you think that's something that critics should do? It's only happened a couple of times, but I think it's natural. And especially when you're doing capsule reviews, sometimes you don't have, you don't have the luxury of... Uh, as we might have in the olden times of having a record with you for a week or so to really mull over what your response to it is. You know, you, it's quite, it's not unusual to get a CD and have to turn it around super quick. Um, and Before you've even finished listening to it. <laughs> and also, I mean, the other point there, uh, with, with long lead times, if you're writing for ma uh, monthly magazines, you, you're often listening to something... Um, two months or more before it's in the shops. And people should know also now that, especially with the long lead time stuff, that you often don't get a CD yeah. posted to you. What you, you get, get stream. what you get is a stream on the internet. Um, you, get a, you get a link to click and you, you log in with your login thing and, and you, you, um, you have all the songs and you often can't transplant them between mm. one computer and another. So you often can't, you know, you're sort of bound to your desk and you have uh, the... Uh, can't listen to music in its natural habitat. It's, it's well, all wrong, mate, I tell you. And you, can, you often get timed streams. I got the new Weezer record for an hour. Yeah, so people should know that. I mean, it's, yeah. it's Clem's right. You can't if if you get to sit with a with a physical CD um, for a week or two, and um, you know, put it on your iPod and listen on the train for a couple of weeks, and really, really get amongst it. You're lucky. Mm. And even with bands, like Beck is someone I always crap on about, but he always gets in his car and he, like with his new CD, and he goes for a bit of a drive with it and makes sure he can hear and how it sort of you know, rumbles with the car. Car is my best sound system when it definitely would be my, my definitely how I'd road test literally yeah. well, any, any kind of music. That's the old audio engineer trick. If you when you've made a record, you um you you make a copy whether it's a cassette or a CD or whatever, and put it in your car stereo, and if it sounds all right then you know it sounds all right. Then you know it's, it's past the test. <laughs> well, we're talking about recorded music. What about live music and criticism? Uh, where does it fit into, into the way you see the role of the critic? I absolutely adore good personal um, live reviews. What, I, what I'm getting a little bit jack of, and it's just that constant thing where people are either texting their friends, and I do it all the time, so I'm going to be, I try and sort of hide it. Um, but if, the, if people are tweeting, constantly tweeting, you know, I know it's been said many times before, but to actually try and enjoy what you're seeing, you need to sort of almost, to sort of switch that off and be able to, you know, let yourself become engrossed by the music. Because it can be a distraction. If you, there's two people on either side of you, do you tweet, mean, tweeting about it. Do you mean you see writers tweeting about it or well, bit, well everyone at Splinter in the Grass this girl was like Sally Cinnamon can't get up there I've heard there was shit anyway I'm like I'm seeing the strokes right now if you got off your ass and got up here a bit earlier you'd see that this is they kind of it was fucking incredible yeah it's better to write about live music as a writer I think um, because you've got the human element I mean mm. you've got you've got um, you've it's you know you're not distanced from it you're close to it you've got the band um, and, and their relationship with the audience 
audience. So um, uh, it, it, it can be that there's a lot more to write about and a lot more to feed off of. Yeah. Uh, one of my favourite reviews of a live performance over the last few years was, believe it or not, it was of Nana Muscuri and it was written by Robert Forster in, in The Independent and, uh, sorry, not in The, sorry, in the Monthly, um, Independent Monthly, is thinking of another title there. But Rob Forster of The Go-Betweens, he, he actually did a completely straight-faced review of Nana Muscuri, who's who I went to see with my parents. Uh, I bought them tickets and went along. And uh, I, I'd actually seen the same concert that he, that he wrote about. And he, he was able to make something which I thought would be um, just gratuitous and, you know, not that there'd be nothing to say about it. After I saw the concert, I thought it's really interesting that uh, the paper I was working for then didn't didn't actually think it was worth reviewing. And then reading Rob's piece, I thought there's actually something that he's nailed here and he's written about it completely seriously and as a piece of writing, it completely works. You know, well, the, the of, line, co of course he should write about it completely seriously. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but I, I guess that's an example of what Chris was saying before of the longer, more reflective piece about. And in this case, it wasn't just saying you know which song she did and in what order or anything like that. It was really about um, a, a, an ageing uh, singer, say, you know, going out and saying goodbye graciously to the world, even though her voice wasn't as good as it was 30 or 40 years ago, but putting her whole career into an incredible context. And yeah. um, I think that's what I really enjoy about the, those sort of longer form pieces when they talk about a live performance. Yeah, because you can you can eyeball the performer and you can you can sense how they are. And I mean, you know, a good a good live review is to me anyway, or well, the ones I like reading and writing. Not that I write live reviews much anymore, but I did for a, a long time. Um, it's just about your experience of the night. I mean, it doesn't have to be factual mm. about what was played. And, yeah. and seriously, I mean, facts are overrated in music criticism. It should be, mm -hmm. it's, to me anyway, it's about oh, feelings yeah. and, 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 what, and, and you know, how things feel to you and how, how music makes you feel. And, and in a live context, you've got a lot more of that going on. So it's, it can be a really good vehicle, yeah. It's a good point you made, Chris, because I remember I was reading an A.A. Gill uh, piece about Glastonbury years ago, and he didn't mention any specific music at all, and it was like the best live review I've ever read. It was like just this yep. long piece and saying how within 10 minutes he was in a teepee with some kind of strange headgear on, and how did he get here? <laughs> it was like a classic kind of Glasto moments, and the way he wrote it, just plowed on through, plowed on through, without saying, and then Muse played this song. Like, it was just it was yeah. great writing. I mean, uh, I mean, the point there is that um, mu music has a has a deeper meaning for everybody, and it's about how you feel and what you feel and what you remember about things and what you hope for, and that's what it taps into. And um, to me, that's what that's what criticism should evoke. You know, it shouldn't be about um, chords and stuff. It's not interesting. That said, um, to what extent do you think being a musician can uh, enrich? The, the vocabulary of, of music criticism. I'm waiting to get called out on it because I don't play any instruments on 30 Average DJ. I think I think it's I, what is it even is it even rated? I was going to say it's overrated, but I there are I think it just depends on your own on your tone. You know, there are some writers who are very down with music theory, and yeah. it, then there's people like Robert Forster who are obviously. Well, uh, I think his his first. description of what people are actually doing is often illuminating to the whole process uh, of how music's made. And it can be, but yeah. but it's not. It doesn't drown his reviews out. Yeah, exactly. I think it can also be very distracting to just um, fill reviews with... Because mm. most people aren't musicians, you know, yeah. so... And that, I think, gets back before we go to questions. I think we are thinking about audiences, and I, I guess before we were talking about... Um, I raised the question, who, who's criticism for? Um, do, do you actually imagine a particular group of people you want to write for? Do you write for your friends? I mean, when I started in radio, I was obsessed with the fact that this was a way I could talk to my friends back in the days when I was on Triple R. Mm. And it's pro that probably was the audience. Uh, mm. But um, do, do you have, a, a you know, in your mind, the, um, the, a group of people that you're actually writing for? Mm, I don't, not really. Um, it depends on the, on the medium as well. <laughs> I write short um, album reviews for The Age Melbourne magazine. It's, I, I reckon people can read them and decide whether they want to buy the CD or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, other things I write for A2 or for EG or when I was writing for Mess and Noise, 
it's, I don't care whether they buy it. I just want to write something. Mm. I wasn't talking just about consumers, but just pe- when I say who you're writing for, like who, who are the people that you're speaking to when you're writing? I guess what, what I was asking. Who, anyone who would actually enter into a conversation with me, I guess. Mm. Um, it's maybe a version of myself. All right, which leads to one more question before we go to the floor, which is um, dealing, with, uh, dealing with responses from people to your work. I've got to bring something up then. <laughs> Please okay. do. All right. All right, so I just told Clem backstage then that a few years ago, um, she hasn't she hasn't found out that this is just someone sent her a dildo into impress saying Clem Basto needs a good route. <laughs> Obviously a disgruntled And pundit. not even a real one, just a plastic just a, just a, dick. Right. Yeah. That was yeah, that she'd given a bad review to and you know, conversely, I, I, sorry, I, I've sat, I, um, in my first week at doing it in Herald Sun, I wrote something bad about Dallas Crane, the fact that they'd, they'd lost their records, but perhaps that wasn't such a bad thing considering their output had been decidedly generic in recent times. And <laughs> she got a text apparently saying, who's this Mikey Carl, uh, etc." And every time I've seen him since, it's always a bit icy. So, but I mean, I, I stand by what I said. I get, a, I get a fair bit of feedback, not as much as I used to. You yeah. know, it's... it's I, I suppose writing for street press, um, it's a little bit more grassroots, so you're reviewing bands who wouldn't necessarily end up in the age of the Herald Sun and, and thus also moving in those circles. So they will bail yeah. you up at the tote and say, you reviewed my band poorly, um, perhaps in slightly more colourful language. Mm. And I tend to say, well, you know, release something good next time. <laughs> <laughs> I used to, I have to say, I used to just disregard this whole um, idea of the, you know, I was fairly fearless when I started writing about film until one night I was at a very nice function at a cinema in Sydney and someone came up to me and said, um, that director over there, have you ever met him? And I said, no. Uh, well, um, you better decide now whether you want to or not because he wants to come over and kill you. <laughs> and apparently it's like this film off, which gets back into that thing about the treatment of, you know, the, the betrayal that some people feel if you're, if you're letting the local side down. But uh, it did actually give me pause for thought after that. And I thought that, you know, if not fear of my life, uh, I did actually have, um, I guess, a particular sense of there being um, uh, a vehemence with which, you know, my, my criticism might be received by the people who've made what they think is good art, right. uh, irrespective of what my verdict happens to be. Well, I had a great com- phone conversation with Nick from Jet actually about that in the at the height of the um, the, the fracas, and he rang up and fracas. after a while the he said, imbruglio. "Yes, <laughs> he said, you know, I just want you to respect what we do." And I said, "Well, you have to respect what I do. Um, you know, I am also uh, engaging in a, a form of art. Uh, you may or may not see it that way." But and at the end of it, it was kind of the hatchet was buried. I still hated them, yeah. and they still hated me. But you know that was that was an interesting um, example because up until then they had. It's difficult when you know when they're when it's a major label band. You kind of think, oh, they're never going to read it. You know, you can slag off the Red Hot Chili Peppers. It's not like they're going to come down and ring up Impress. But that was an interesting example of it. Um, coming true, I guess. I think the, the stakes are higher in other forms of criticism too. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that a bad review would particularly affect sales of a... Mm. Of a it might have a, of a small independent one if it was a prominent review, but know, you know, yeah. like restaurant, like a restaurant review can 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 close a restaurant, a poor review. Yeah. yeah. And 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 book reviews, um, prominent book reviews can seriously affect book sales. I mean, you know, restaurant critics are always sued. Um, music critics are never sued. I don't think. Mm. Have you ever been sued, Mike? Been three times. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Have, except, no, he hasn't. Okay. Except him, but he works for. We'll try and sort that out by the end of the evening. Yeah. Okay.